Good afternoon. My name is Sofia milosevic Bielefeld, and I'm delighted to be participating in the Art and Humanity Conference today. I want to start by thanking the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Museum, the Geneva Haute École d'Art et de Design, the International Committee of the Red Cross and the Geneva Red Cross for giving me the opportunity to discuss a topic that is close to my heart. I will give a brief presentation of three different memorization approaches and I look forward to your questions and our discussion afterwards. In post-conflict con context, memory plays an important role in building lasting and sustainable peace. Reconstructing narratives of the past gives individuals a sense of closure and participate in the collective healing of the social fabric these individuals live in. Memorization initiatives have multiplied around the world and participate in different mechanisms of reconciliation healing, as well as civic engagement for both individuals and societies which have broken down due to violence. Memorialization is one of the very many forms that symbolic reparation can take. It has gained attention with the development of transitional justice around the world. Number of Truth Commission's reports recommend memorialization activities such as building monuments, and museum rituals, renaming public facilities and official apologies as part of a broader symbolic reparation program. These initiatives can work towards goals that may not be addressed by mainstream transitional justice mechanisms. Indeed, memory and memorialization allow for the recognition of individual victims and survivors and their stories of the conflict. They allow different generations to understand the conflict and mediate between the past and the present. They allow the society collective space for mourning uh, that can promote the process of healing past wounds. The element of truth-telling is central in the mechanism of transitional justice, whereby which a silent story and narrative is given its right place. For memorialization to have a profound effect on society and the non-recurrence of violence, it must be an inclusive, holistic process involving victims and survivors and be context-driven. Art and performative practices have been shown to be powerful vectors for victims' voices. This presentation will focus on three different art-based approach, uh, approaches to memorialization, body mapping, community-based theater, and memory boxes. Through these, we will see how art is articulated around memory and acts as a powerful ground for understanding the past and creating a meaningful dialogue, thus opening avenues for reconciliation. Body maps are pictorial representation of a person's life story in this life-size outline of the, of the person's body. The purpose of the process is to enable unrecognized survivors a chance to express and remember their experience. They create a safe space for participants to remember and help in the re healing of their past trauma. This psychosocial method was developed in South Africa out of the Memory Box project in 2002 that sought to help HIV AIDS patient to prepare their passing and create a timekeeper and depository of memory for their children or families. Body maps stemmed out from this to address the stigmas faced by HIV AIDS victims and acknowledge their illness, not simply with the physical manifestation, um, but also as a way of representing the, the mental suffering linked to the illness. Beyond being a powerful tool for self-reflection and psychosocial support, body maps are used as research tools in terms of participatory qualitative method, as advocacy tools when displayed in exhibitions or publications, or as educational tools. In 2012, TICA, a Kenyan organization worked with a group of 12 torture survivors who had been illegally detained and tortured at the Nyayo House. 
Body mapping was used to enable these torture victims to create life-size portraits that illustrate their life experiences. The infamous Nyayo House in central Nairobi served as a clandestine torture and detention center during the 1980s and the 1990s under the regime of President Moi. In a building that was used as a public service facilities, facility, prisoners were subjected to various forms of torture, including waterboarding and extreme temperature changes in their cells. The cells were found in the basement of the building, and, it, and the building continues to, be, to operate today. The body maps are, um, are developed with a selected group during a workshop usually lasting five days. During the workshop, the survivors are gradually made uh, to feel safe, thus enabling them to start sharing their painful stories of trauma and loss, as well as their hopes, aspiration for the future, and enable them to reflect on the support structures that they have developed through the years. All these are expressed through the use of art, drawing and painting, with the help of one or more facilitator. Over the course of the five-day workshop, the participants tell their story through different art-based exercises, developing a lifeline articulated around important events, identifying physical and emotional effects of trauma, and how to show these on the body. Such an exercise places the torture, rape, or illness within the larger context of each person's life. As the participant works on their maps, it brings a greater understanding to the psycho psychological trauma as well as their visible scars, enabling a more holistic understanding of their own past. The body maps are progressively created and populated with these stories of physical and psychological suffering, as well as resilience. The maps are then shared among the participants and narrated. This process takes the individual story and puts them into a larger context, demonstrating a pattern of abuse and repression which took place under the Moy regime. It also enables a victim to consider the commonality and articulating themselves as a coherent group. When the participants agree, the maps are then displayed in public and uh, the participants share their testimonies. Despite the intentions to declare the place a heritage site, the Kenyan government has backed down despite petition from survivors organization Human, local human rights and victims organization argue that the government's reluctance to declare the site a heritage site is related directly to the truth-telling potential of a site. On July the 21st, 2010, 21 victims of torture and unlawful detention won a high court case against the state and were granted compensation of a total of, 20, of 40 million Kenyan shillings. The decision was groundbreaking um, in that the compensation was granted outside the Kenyan Truth, Justice and Reconciliation Committee process. Though the decision was made primarily because the case was lodged before the formation of uh, that commission. In this case, the participants of the body, map, body mapping workshop did not display maps in a larger exhibition, but reunited a year later after making their body maps to evaluate the workshop. The group decided to go back to Nyayo House for a small ceremony during which cleansing rituals were performed. The victims did a silent walk through the cells as well as a lighting of, uh, lighting of candles ceremony. These were a symbol of healing for the survivors, as well as a way to show the light, truth, and bring healing to others um, around the survivors. The workshop allowed them to talk about their experience of torture victims and to share these stories with their families. 
In Afghanistan, the testimonies of victims of human rights abuse have been central to develop theater pieces. Afghan artists have used the different, techniques, di different techniques, such as playback theater and theater of the oppressed, to share victim stories. Community-based theater is more, most closely identified with Brazilian theater director Augusto Bo and his Theater of the Oppressed, which launched an international movement using his techniques as a vehicle for participatory social change. Gold developed a process whereby audience member, so-called spect actors, um, can stop a performance and assume a protagonist's role on stage to change a, uh, the dramatic action. Propose various solutions and discuss plans for change and train themselves for social action. Playback theatre is another widely used technique in community-based theatre. Developed in the United States in 1975, this method enables an audience member to tell a story from her or his life and then watch as actors and musicians immediately recreate the scene, giving it artistic shape and coherence. The assumption here is that when memories are told and retold, they go beyond the original boundaries of the individual storyteller's space, time and body, and are relocated in the mind and the bodies of the performers and the audience. By telling, watching and even participating um, in a performance, the experiences of others become collective. And while this cannot recreate by any degree of accuracy the emotional scope of generalized mass violence, it can give the audience the feeling of actually being there, providing a space for shared memory. In Afghanistan, after more than three decades of violent conflict with millions of victims, accountability for massive human rights abuses remains elusive, while the voices and stories of the victims continue to be silenced and therefore unacknowledged. Community-based theatre has proved success successful in ways of breaking the silence about issues concerning past and present human rights violation in the country. The Afghan organization Ardo has used playback theater and theater of the oppressed as a means of documenting people's personal stories and their experiences of loss and war. Theater creates space for the victims of Afghanistan to come together and analyze the past in the context of the present and enable them to become active, active protagonists in shaping a more peaceful and just Afghanistan. Using playback theatre, Ardo developed a play called Infinite Incompleteness. Afghan victims from different parts of the country were invited to share their experience of war. Over the course of 20 performances, approximately 120 stories were told, and a total of 10 stories were carefully selected, linguistically edited and arranged in a basic storyline that takes into consideration Afghanistan's ethnic and linguistic diversity. The three main national languages are spoken by characters during, during the performances. It also takes into account different, different parts of the conflict starting from 1978 to the present, as well as promoting both male and female voices. These real accounts were complemented by a parallel storyline consisting of a series of fictional actions. Infinite Incompleteness premiered on the Human Rights Day in 2010 at the Lycée Estiklal in Kabul. It has since been performed for larger audience in various parts of Afghanistan. The, the play was also shown in Washington DC and in New York City. H.R. Doe continues to use um, community-based theatre in its transitional justice and memorialization work, incorporating in um, to its Memory Boxes exhibition. <laughs> Um, 
میبینم آه. امید همه میپرسن چند سال هستی سی سال است دو سال کوچکتر از رویا بود The last methodology I will talk about today are the memory boxes. The memory boxes represent a form of small personal museum, as well as a memorial built and curated by the family members in order to remember and commemorate a person, the person they have lost. A memory box is built as a small and portable wooden box and created by the family members of a victim in order to store significant objects and belonging of the loved one, the loved one they have lost during the conflict and violence. Inspired by the South African um, project mentioned before and adapted to the Afghan context, the creation of a memory box involves a psychosocial process conducted in the form of a workshop. The memory box are produced as a result of an aesthetic process conducted by a trained facilitator who leads the participant through a variety of artistic games and exercises to a path of storytelling. Participants are chosen in order to represent different communities and region. As part of the exercise is to foster understanding among those communities, promoting reconciliation. Each participant can choose which moments of their life they wish to focus on and how to represent these moments in their personal boxes using specific images and objects. The process usually takes three to five days and includes a full day of trust and group building exercises as well as activities that foster the participants' gradual discovery of their own creative capacity. All exercises are used to foster dialogue. Initial discussions center on war and peace in Afghanistan, while the participants share their personal stories and experience. Eventually, the focus shifts to make it the individual memory boxes. Under the guidance of the facilitator, but with full autonomy and ownership, the participants create their own boxes, consisting primarily of personal objects, which often belong to their deceased family member such as copy, copies of the Quran, mem, uh, wedding um, certificates, jewelry given by a late husband, photos of deceased children, letters, identity cards. In addition, during the creative process, participants produce further artistic creation related to their life stories. Often these include poems, photographs of their current life situation or paintings. Another important element is the creation of a personal timeline. This process involves the participants sketching their entire life journey on paper with colored pens, crayons and paint, highlighting significant events in their lives. The participants are also asked to reflect on the national flag of Afghanistan. The national flag carries an important symbolic value as it has changed with each new regime capturing the capital Kabul and thus a flag is often attached to a very painful personal loss. To reflect this, the participants are asked to paint the flag, which is the most significant in their own life story, and then proceed to draw a second one that reflects an ideal Afghanistan. All the personal objects and artistic artifacts that have been created and gathered uh, participants are then invited to set up their own personal museum. They assemble and curate their memory boxes in the most aesthetic and artistic manner ready for display. The participants also are also asked to prepare a brief verbal presentation they will use to explain the context of their box. The aesthetic process includes in a f um, concludes with a final walk through a symbolic museum of memory boxes followed by a closing circle in which the participants share their last thoughts and feeling about the experience of the workshop. Once the creation completed, the memory boxes are presented publicly. The family of the victim acts as a guide explaining to the visitors the significance of the objects presented in the box. 
The process of creating the books and sharing them with the public is both painful as well as emotionally demanding for the participants involved. Despite this strain, many of the participants recognize the healing benefit as well as the importance of having their story heard. Using art-based memorization in the form of body mapping, community-based theater, or memory books, the victims and survivors are empowered to work on and conceptualize their own memory projects within a group. It creates a safe space and opportunity to highlight their voices and experience as victims and survivor. Also, they create a timeline of the violence demonstrating that all the different regions and all the different groups and communities have been touched by different stages of conflict. When other uh, transitional justice mechanisms fail due to the lack of political will, memorialization work offer a window into the lives of victims where they explore personal histories through a reflective creative process, resulting in the creation of physical spaces of remembrance and memory. In doing so, individual memories and narrative can be understood from a collective perspective as they contribute to a more collective truth-telling endeavor and healing process. Today, as we struggle for more social justice around the world, what is the role of institutions such as museums in these struggles? Thank you.